Imagine that you are standing in a big gallery, surrounded by people you've never met, talking about paintings you've never seen, and you come across a portrait. But what do you see? What is unique about a portrait that is different from a writing, a film, a regular painting, or a regular person? Here, go ahead and take a look. Try to find its uniqueness. And as you do, let's take a look together at Portrait of a Lady on Fire. We're in France, 1760. We see a young woman named Marianne who will soon be revealed to be a painter commissioned to paint a wedding portrait of a young aristocrat lady named Eloise. Simple enough, except Eloise doesn't want to get married and has been refusing to be painted. Marianne is told to act as a hired companion for Eloise and she must paint her in secret. And in doing so, the two start to realize that they may be in love. So the film is about love, but there is something very different about this tale of love that sets itself apart from the other love stories, in that the film deals with a relationship between two women, and more specifically that of an artist and her muse. There's always a subtle yet profound energy shared between a painter and his or her subject of interest. And this found energy is not a coincidence, in fact, it's a prerequisite. This energy usually mirrors a tension that can be found in romantic partners because the formed bond between the two must be genuine and significant. This work of art can only be accomplished through collaborative means. An artist's skill can never be enough. The subject must understand the intent of the work and be as artistic and precise, if not more, than the artist who does the painting. And if the work process is prolonged like it is for Marianne and Eloise, the two relationships they share, that of a romantic partner and that of an artist and a subject, is bound to go hand in hand. And we are given a privilege to watch the two mirroring relationships as a single connection, perceiving it as something new and unprecedented. In fact, this is exactly what we're challenged to do in this film, to catch all acts of art. Let's give it a try. The very first thing we witness is an unfinished portrait done by an unknown artist. There's no connection and no insight yet to who the house lady may be. And that's precisely the level of acquaintance the previous artist achieved. Faceless. At first, driven by the weight of her task, Marianne too is quick to only focus on the subject's features based on the conventional rules of painting. The conversation the two share is generic and unmotivating. The sketches are careful like Marianne is careful hiding her true identity, and the stares the two women give are uncoordinated and disconnected, just like Marianne's attempt at Eloise's portrait is scattered and separated. And Marianne already knows that something is not quite right, yet she is still moved primarily by her goal. The conversation, although progressively more heartfelt, still yields a predictable outcome. Marianne always ends up delivering lines that are guided by her own guilt and objectives, instantly cutting the sincere connection that could have been. She tells Sophie, the maid, that she still needs to see Eloise smile. It's not that she will be forced to paint Eloise with a big smile, but it simply implies the nature of the art we are dealing with. She must have everything first, before choosing one. Without knowing all about the subject, the painting becomes lifeless, and as an artist, Marianne doesn't wish that, to create something that isn't her. Unfortunately and obviously, that's exactly what happens in the first painting. Do note that by this time, their love for each other has already grown to a substantial amount, whether they know it themselves or not. This is hinted by a number of clues. First, Eloise starts to smile. The way they communicate and dance with and around each other is more in sync and honest. Also, the original portrait catches on fire, which will be a recurring symbol for passion and love. This moment highlights Marianne's or Eloise's love for the other woman as the painting starts to burn from the heart of the portrait and burns away in front of Marianne. Finally, when Marianne reveals that she's a painter, Eloise ends the conversation with C'était donc ça vos regards. What a shame, isn't it?
Eloise goes on to tell Marianne that the painting is a disappointment, asking if that's how she sees her. Marianne replies that there are conventions, rules and ideas that one must follow, and that many times she had to paint with fleeting memories. To Eloise, the painting lacked life and presence. She refutes Marianne by saying that not everything is fleeting, that some feelings are deep. And this is really important. For one, she is right even when we just consider the conventions of what makes a great portrait. A British artist, Edward Burne Jones, once stated that the only expression allowable in great portraiture is the expression of character and moral quality, not anything temporary, fleeting, or accidental. It's not just about the accuracy of one's outer appearance, but about one's inner significance. Eloise thinks this way because this portrait is a simple look, a gaze that lacks substance, but in another meaning as well. Remember that she is about to get married to a man she barely knows. Everything that is going on in her life is forcing her to be someone she is not. She hates being gazed upon and objectified as something less than her. Marianne is someone who she thought is potentially more than other people in her life. In other words, Eloise wasn't happy that the painting was done according to the current norm, the expectation of the society that she is forced to follow in her life every day. And Marianne was the only one she believed to be different due to their unconscious spark, someone who would see Eloise in her true form. And since Marianne shares the same feeling, she decides to smudge the portrait and restart everything. Look familiar? Eloise, catching on to what Marianne has done, convinces her mother to let Marianne stay by stating that she will pose for the portrait, and her mother leaves to go to Italy for five days. A lot happens in these five days. The film commences to discuss the woman's relationships in depth. We start with this scene, which is later revealed to be a crucial moment when Marianne first realized she is truly in love with Eloise. Although the audience doesn't have this information at this point, sensing this shift is very possible by the scene that follows. Marianne sketches Eloise again. I mentioned two things earlier, one that the two types of relationship they share as lovers and as a painter and her muse are very similar in nature, and two, that the reason why the first portrait was a failure was because of the discrepancy between their position as lovers and the way the resulting image got created. Here Marianne is painting Eloise sleeping on a couch. Eloise isn't posing for her, she isn't staying still, and is in a vulnerable state, one that doesn't keep her safe, if you will. Yet Marianne decides to draw. Not only is this not the standard way to do portrait, but in doing so she is accepting Eloise's previous criticism and truly announcing who she is with her. In simple forms, this implies their growing love and loyalty. And spontaneously, their relationships become more equal, both as lovers and as painter versus subject. The director, Celine Siama, said that the power dynamic we often observe in other love films are absent here because, well, this film deals with two independent women in the 18th century. So such equality is simple and unawkward to achieve. There is no one protagonist because they both are. Eloise even says it herself, equality is a pleasant feeling. And this is beautifully shown in the next scene where Marianne continues with the portrait. Marianne, who is doing the painting, is shot close as the one in control, and Eloise, the subject, is shot from afar, wide and exposed. As Marianne talks with Eloise, she gets a chance to boast her knowledge about Eloise and her small habits. Eloise, at first, is shook by the disclosure, but tells Marianne that they are in the same position and to come to where she is. Right here, the camera starts to move forward, and Eloise turns the table by exposing Marianne of her little habits. By the time Marianne goes back to her original position, the camera now captures Eloise as the painter and Marianne as the subject, wide and exposed. As their love for each other advances together, their assumed roles in this real setting are also shared, granted not in a literal sense but through camera work. And this type of suggestions are constantly introduced as the days progress. The next evening, the three women gather around the table and read a book about Orpheus and Eurydice. The story is simple. Orpheus was married to Eurydice when one day she dies. Orpheus visits the underworld and convinces the ruler to let him take Eurydice back. He is granted permission under one condition. He can't look back to check on Eurydice until outside the caves of the underworld. 
He agrees, but unfortunately turns around before reaching the light in fear of losing her and Eurydice is lost forever. The three women have a heated discussion about the story and Marianne states something very intriguing. She says, Il ne fait pas le choix de l'amoureux, il fait le choix du poète. Yes, instead of making the lover's choice, he makes the poet's choice. Eloise takes a moment to let that statement sink in and adds, Peut-être que c'est elle qui lui a dit. Retourne-toi. The message is pretty obvious for this one, but it's still meaningful. Marianne, who literally crossed the ocean to get to Eloise, can be seen as Orpheus. The scene is foreshadowing that although Marianne came as a savior to take Eloise out of her doomed destiny that is the upcoming marriage, she will end up with a poet's choice, to keep Eloise in her memory by leaving alone. In fact, later in the film, Marianne constantly turns around at night to see Eloise in her wedding dress just fade away. This idea haunts her throughout. And at this point, some may ask how she sees the actual dress in advance. Well, remember that this whole story is a retelling from Marianne's memory. It only makes sense as this will soon turn out to be the last image of Eloise she sees before departure. And what Eloise adds at the end suggests that it'll actually be her who eventually convinces Marianne to choose that path. That she knows she will get married and that Marianne will go her way because she agrees with the poet's choice as well. But more on that later. With the rather depressing idea, the film moves on to one of the most memorable scenes of the entire film. They're at a bonfire with other women. The woman starts singing in harmony, the song is meticulous and thrilling. Marianne and Eloise stare at each other, this time with perfect coordination. Everything in this scene is symbolic, with the sole purpose of demonstrating their leap of faith, regardless of their foreseeable outcome. The song evolves as a new pair of women join in on the choir, and the scene intensifies together, reflecting Marianne and Eloise's state of mind. As the woman choir accompanies the two into their daring journey of love, there is a big fire between the two. This is similar to the previous scene of the original portrait catching on fire, except this time the fire is bigger and more open. So much so that Eloise actually catches on fire, literally, and Marianne runs toward her to help as Eloise pulls her and the scene dramatically transitions into the start of their actual days as romantic partners. It's a stunning scene that illustrates the most pivotal moments of the film without any in-your-face exposition. As their love becomes very overt, the film decides to put Sophie in between the two to keep the spirit fresh and fascinating. What Sophie is, is a good friend, a contrasting image from the lovers we've been following. This allows the audience to see how powerful their love story is and at the same time to be able to understand this unusual dynamic and to realize that there is a beauty and force to all relationships these women have, whether that is of love or of companionship. And with yet another painting scene, we see a magnificent idea of equalization of woman as the maid, the painter, and the lady all come in equal stances in this specific incident. To jump to conclusions, in a way, it's unfortunate since their fate as lovers are somewhat tragic at the end and especially compared to how powerful the female union under friendship could be, it's even more heartbreaking, but that may exactly be the point. So what happens? They decide to reenact the abortion process Sophie had to go through and paint it. Women had to deal with a lot of oppression in the 18th century, and just like their forbidden relationship, abortion too was considered a taboo. Although to my knowledge, abortion was not criminalized and considered illegal unless done after quickening, which is about four months into pregnancy. Fine. Also consider this system, the maid was probably expected to carry the child, just like how Eloise was to marry this man. In a way, they are all challenging this system and celebrating their individuality by carrying out this act and painting it afterwards, all the while creating a great opportunity for the two Lees to bond and become even closer. Considering our previous dissection of what painting symbolizes, this scene may be eye-opening in that Marianne is accepting and painting herself to be this woman who is deliberately opposing the system, to love Eloise and to consciously acknowledge it. 
Again, the irony is just that they end up not being able to carry out their own wish while successfully helping the maid carry out hers to challenge the system. Similarly, the first portrait was done according to the rules, which Eloise described as lacking life of any form. So they paint this picture, which is not a norm, but reality. The face of woman exactly how Eloise wished her portrait to be. True. With these build-ups, the film finally sums itself up with literally visualizing both woman taking the role of the painter together and finishing the portrait. The second portrait is more satisfying for both of them. For Marianne, because she sees herself in this portrait of Eloise. For Eloise, it's the same. It's no longer an objectification, but rather a gesture for love. A beautiful means to which they can remember and love each other. As they gaze into this painting, they can recall this time. On the last day, Marianne sketches drawings of each of them to remember each other. Eloise here, and Marianne here in the book. The mother arrives and it's time for them to say goodbye. Overwhelmed with emotion, Marianne turns and runs downstairs, keeping herself from crying. As she opens the door to leave, Retourne-toi! The last image of Eloise is gone, like that. Reminding the audience of the tale of Orpheus and what Eloise has said about the tale earlier. In a way, this is one ending to the film. But the work goes on, showing Marianne in present time as a successful painter, witnessing Eloise's new portrait on the wall. As Marianne stares at the painting, she recalls her time with Eloise. Although they both are staring at each other, one is a portrait stuck in time, physically absent for a connection. But the camera zooms in and captures the page number of Eloise's book as 28, the page Marianne used to sketch herself on their last day. With this, she now knows that Eloise sees her back through memory and beyond time and space, they are in fact truly connected. The last scene of the film has Marianne entering a concert hall and finding Eloise. The orchestra plays Presto from Vivaldi's Summer, which is something Marianne played for Eloise back in the day. As Eloise listens to the music, she too recalls her memory with Marianne, who is stuck in the past in the form of a musical melody. They are once again truly connected. I asked what makes a portrait unique in the beginning of this video and suggested to take a look at this film to find the answer. Just like a portrait, this film paints desire, not just love. And just like a portrait, the two women always faced each other, not the world. And like this scene, sometimes a memory is more essential than the present. As Marianne at the end secretly stares at Eloise in the present, we can't help but think that perhaps the painting stare back in the gallery was as well. Because with such energy, regardless of their physical presence, there is a real stare, a real understanding, and real love the two women share. Thanks for watching. And that's it for me.